Today we're going to talk about energy from flowing water. This is in the um, actually Energy 201 course um, on energy renewable energy technology. <clears throat> so uh, flowing water is one of the big ones. Uh, big ones being uh, solar electric, solar thermal, wind power, and flowing water. Uh, we can run the world on on just those sources of of energy <coughs> excuse me and um, we can use it um, the energy in flowing water for grinding grain for sawing lumber for factory power even without converting it to electricity we can use it electricity can we can use it for electricity um, from high head meaning the water falls a very long distance uh, uh, thousands of feet sometimes or, or low head the water only falls maybe five or ten feet so there's very different considerations for both of those uh, types of um, electrical uh, hydro generators. Resources for flowing water can be streams, tides, ocean currents, waves, rivers, <clears throat> and um, you don't even need to um, <clears throat> uh, necessarily have, uh, you can use the water actually as a storage medium. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Picture over here shows um, some wave energy converters, and these take the up and down motion of the uh, waves and convert it into electricity. And these are actually in commercial operation off the coast of Scotland and off the coast of Portugal. <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about um, in this uh, renewable energy technology course, we're going to we're going to focus strictly on flowing water in um, in streams and rivers, uh, and um, we'll look at. Uh, um, the history of w uh, water power here in Iowa. Here's the Otomo Hydro Station. It was built in uh, 1931, 3.2 megawatts, generates 10 to 12 million kilowatt hours a year. Uh, it was built during the Depression, and um, it was uh, built in such a way that all the families got work uh, out of the project. So it was a community project owned by the city, still owned by the city, um, and since 1931 to now, it's been generating regularly, reliably, 10 to 12 million kilowatt hours a year. The city of uh, Ottumwa sells that. They, they get a gross sales of about $500,000 uh, $500, per year. Costs about $200,000 per year to run that. So the city of Ottumwa for the last, since 1931, has been getting the equivalent of $300,000 a year every year so that's um I, I haven't added that up but if we uh we'll see 30 1931 to 19 um <clears throat> 90 the 2015 is uh, roughly 85 years 84 years i guess so 84 times 300,000 uh it's a lot of money anyway <clears throat> you can do the math but um and, and it, we compare this with MUM's annual consumption of about 4 million kilowatt hours per year you see that the um the Ottumwa station generates, you know, two and a half to three times as much energy as MUM uses in a year. <clears throat> so this is, a, you know, this we, we're, we're wondering when renewable energy is going to come online. Well, it already has, and uh, in many cases have been operating reliably for very long periods of time. And here's what it looks like today. <clears throat> uh, the Keokuk Hydro Station on the Mississippi River. When it was built, it was the largest hydroelectric power plant in the world. There are 15 turbines, 142 megawatts total. So uh, the Ottumwa plant's uh, 3.2 megawatts, so significantly bigger. <coughs> Mississippi River is a much bigger river. Generates about 750 million kilowatt hours a year, enough for about 75,000 homes. Now remember, MUM only uses 5 million, so this could provide the energy for MUM many, many times over. <coughs> uh, when it was built, it was the largest monolithic concrete dam in the world. <clears throat> now, in the 1800s, there were a dozen or more water mills right here in Jefferson County on the Cedar River, the Skunk River, and other water courses. The mills used, were used for grinding grain and lumber and for running machinery, you know, not generating electricity, of course, in the 1800s. It was the late 1800s when uh, hydro, the hydropower first was used to generate electricity. And <clears throat> just to read a little bit of this... Um, it says that on the skunk, this is talking about the Skunk River, that um, below the western boundary of Henry County to the mouth of the fall, <coughs> the to the mouth of the river, the fall appears to be nearly all taken up, meaning that all the places you could put a hydro plant, a water power plant, there is one. Uh, <coughs> let's see. Uh, so far as I could learn, the mills on the lower river are located as follows in order from the mouth. Augusta, Bridgeport, Lowell. Boylston, Otter Mills, Oakland Mills, which we'll talk quite a lot more about. That's only about 15 miles from Fairfield. Star Mills, Merrimack, and Washington. 
The positions of those further upstream may be signif- significantly judged from the summary of counties. So the mills mentioned are all flowering mills <coughs> and carry about three runs of stone each. The dams are generally frame structures and furnish heads from four and a half to eight feet. Uh, it is said that the mills can on the average run 10 months of the year at full capacity, <coughs> but are troubled one month by low water and one month by backwater, meaning the water's too high, too much water. The Oakland Mill suffered from backwater. Um, so anyway, th- we're going to talk more about Oakland Mill. So just to, just to give you an idea here, these are, um, let's see. Uh, the privilege occupied by this Oakland Mill is improved by a frame dam 325 feet long, 9 feet high, filled with stone and planked over. The head on the wheels varies from 5.5 to 8 feet, but average is about 7 feet. When we do a design estimate, we're going to use 8 feet. When we look at Oakland Mills later, we're going to use that as a, as a design exercise. <coughs> and I have a history in water power development. Um, this is a, a book from 1869 uh, that I used to um, use to search for old dams that I could put turbines and generators on and sell power to the utility. Uh, here's one I built in Hamden, Maine, generated between 700,000 and a million kilowatt hours a year. And, uh, you know, it had a bunch of other sustainability features. I built it in 1982, and you can see that it's uh, passive solar, and it's got a solar hot water thing on it. The water is <coughs> behind this road here, and there's a dam underneath the road, and this is a, a tidal area, so the tide actually comes up and down. So the amount of the water drops varies according to the tide. <coughs> this is the type of turbine I built there. I built a cross-flow turbine originally, uh, and the water flows through this turbine out and down through. And here, here it is. <coughs> excuse me. Here it is in uh, with all the pieces together, and so the water comes in here, comes around the corner, and then flows through these guide veins. And you can use these guide veins to shut the water off um, for different times of the year. So if you don't have very much water, you can shut off the water to one third on this side or two thirds of the turbine. So, so you can run either the turbine wide open, one third, or two thirds of its output at still a very high efficiency. And again, another picture of this. Now, you'll notice that it's very similar to the house I built in, in Iowa. You can see the resemblance there. I've used that design quite a lot because I like the high Claire Story windows. Um, and this is another uh, dam that I, uh, I didn't build this, but I owned it. I bought it in, uh, with some other people uh, in Maine, in Frankfort, Maine. And I just took a picture of this last summer. And there's the, the entrance to the water. The water enters the turbines there and uh, exits there. I don't own it anymore. I, I've sold, uh, that's been sold off. And this is a fish, pa- fish passage facility so that fish can come get up over the dam and around the turbine. Now the energy from falling water is related directly to um, the distance the water falls which is called the head and the quantity of water that flows in the pipe which is called the flow. And the flow is typically measured in cubic feet per second. And there's about eight gallons in a cubic foot, just to give you an idea. <coughs> but that for, for, for very small flows, it might be um, measured in gallons per minute. But for anything of any size, it's measured in cubic feet per second. And so let's give an example of a, a, a head of 100 feet, a flow of 50 cubic feet per second. That's about 22,000 gallons per minute, so it's quite a lot of water. And the kilowatts then would be 100 times 50 divided by 11.8 is 400 kilowatts. Now, that doesn't tell us how often it's going to run at 400 kilowatts because there's not always the same amount of water in the river. It depends on how much rainfall, um, various other things, uh, and how much area is, when the rain falls, is collected by that river called the drainage area. So it's not possible to determine just from this number how many kilowatt hours we're going to get per year from this station. So we'll, we'll go into the details of how to calculate that uh, later on in this lecture. Uh, another, another look at this, this is a, what would be called a low head a hydro site. Low heads typically uh, somewhere maybe 30 to, to 6 feet or 5 feet. And so there's a, there's, this is what's called a run of the river um, plant. In other words, you don't take all the water from the river. You just take whatever comes down. You don't store it. So there's a little diversion here. So most of the river is flowing here, but a small fraction is diverted over here into this pipe. Comes down here, spins this turbine, which then spins uh, this generator. And if you remember, a generator is just um, taking a magnet and moving moving it by some wires and you generate electricity. So this is a very simple device. It's just magnets and wires. (coughs) And um, 
they uh, spin in relationship to each other and generate electricity. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> again, you know, for larger projects, you know, 100 kilowatts and above, let's say, you'd use this formula. But for smaller projects, where you're talking about 1,000 watts or less, you use this formula and the answer is in watts. And the head is in uh, feet, but the flow is in gallons per minute. And here the flow is in cubic feet per second. Uh, so how do we measure head and flow? Those are the two things. And again, it's, it's directly proportional. You double the head, you get twice the power. You double the flow, you get twice the power. <clears throat> and so here's one simple way to measure head is you can put some stakes in the ground and then uh, take a, a long stick and put a level on it. And then what you do is you make a straight line from one stick to the next stick down the hill with this, that's in, in the ground here, with this long board. And you make a mark. And then you go down and do it again. And every you, then you add up all the differences in elevation from the where you start to where you end up, and you'll get the, the head and feet. Another way is to use something called a pop level, and I'll try to bring one into the classroom to show you what that looks like. But it's a device that you hold up to your eye, and it has a level in it, and you can you can look precisely straight out in a in a in a in a line that's level with your eye, and you can have somebody hold a stick, and you can measure uh, the height of that stick, and uh, then uh, come down to where the stick was, and do the same thing again, and add all that up, and you'll get the um, you'll get the overall height if you if after you walk down the hill doing this now another way to do this is to take a measurement of what the height from your eye is to the ground and then just look and uh, have somebody um, with a stick or something ahead and make a mark right there and so you know that's the distance from your eye to the ground to that point then you walk up to that point where the stick is and do it again until you get to the top and then you add all the measurements up to take a note of them and you'll get the head. Now another way you can do this is with drones and um, you can you can just uh, fly a drone over for a few minutes uh, over a piece of land and um, there's free available online software that'll take the pictures that drone takes and create contour lines and and be able to determine elevations just from the photos. And um, we're working with a guy named Clem Soda who will who, who is um, 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 showing us in the department how to how to use this technology. We'll do this in the maker course, and we'll also do this uh, in the permaculture course. It's a it's a great new high tech way, an inexpensive way to rapidly uh, map and find elevations on a property. <clears throat> now another thing you can do uses the United States Geological Survey maps, and what a <coughs> contour they, these have contour lines on them. And so what contour lines are? <clears throat> let's say you have a mountain like this. Whoops. <clears throat> and what you do is you um, <clears throat> pick, <clears throat> excuse me, in this case it's 500 foot intervals. So every 500 feet down the mountain you draw a line around the mountain. And so this is the shape at uh, 3,500 feet here and at 3,000 feet and at 2,500 feet. So you, when you look at this here, you can get a, you can kind your mind can kind of make a 3D image of, oh, this is the top of the mountain and this is the bottom of the mountain and this is how steep it is. When the, when the lines are further apart, it's flatter, and when the lines are closer together, it's steeper. So you notice it's steeper on the back side, and the lines are quite close together, and it's shallower on the front side here, and the lines are further apart. This is what it looks like for a stream. <clears throat> if you had a stream flowing this way, then typically um, uh, this is what the contour lines would look like. And you can see here, if you started here, you're going you're gonna to put a hydro station in between here and here. You can see it's 560 to 500. There's a 60-foot there's a drop from here to here. So if you have a map, you can use a map to determine this. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to mention also that there's an effect um, on the head of the flow rate. When you have a lot of water, the water tends to build up on the downstream side of the dam and... Um, and you, you get a lower amount of head. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. You think, okay, when I have a lot of water I, flowing down the river, I have a lot of power, but you also have diminished head. So you can see this is Oakland Mills near Fairfield here, uh, about 15 miles from the classroom. And you can see here there's maybe six, eight feet of head. And down here when there's more water flowing, there's maybe only two feet of head. And so you gotta, on, <clears throat> particularly on big rivers, it doesn't happen in every river, but typically, when the flow rate is high in the spring, your head is, uh, is down. 
Another way to measure flow is to put a little temporary dam in, or if there's already a dam there, you could use that, and then measure the height of the water over the dam. And you can see here <coughs> that um, this um, is a uh, f for flow for a one inch wide weir. So if you had a one inch wide weir, uh, which means a little a little notch in the in the dam, then um, and it's five inches deep water flowing through there, you'll have a flow of about 35 cubic feet per sec, 35 gallons per minute. And so you can use a chart like this and a, and a um, weir or a small uh, dam uh, to measure flow. Uh, it's the same thing. So <clears throat> you can also use the bucket method for calculating water flow. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, uh, people in the previous course saw this, but I'll, I'll just do this because it's, you know, it's just really simple and it's quite quick. So let's l just watch this. So you get the general idea. <clears throat> and um, another, <clears throat> when you're working on bigger projects, then what you have to do is you have to look at um, the United States Geological Survey information. And fortunately, the United States Geological Survey, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, which is a branch of the <clears throat> federal government, has been keeping detailed records of how much water is flowing in streams all over the country for hundreds, hundreds of years now, you know, since the 18, early 1800s. And so this, um, so what you have to look at is you, 
What the collection area for a hydroelectric power project is, is the drainage area. So let's just uh, dig into that concept just a little bit more. So here's the Royal River watershed in Yarmouth, Maine. So here's the Royal River here. It winds up here, goes up here. And what this um, blue outline shows is that when rain falls here, anywhere it falls within this um, blue uh, area, it, um, the area defined by this blue line, it drains into the eventually drains into the Royal River and all comes out here. Now, if it the rain falls on this side, it'll drain over into this river, and I'm not sure what the name of that river is, but it'll drain into that river. And so that's another watershed. So there'll be other watersheds. And this particular watershed is about 141 square miles. So that's kind of like the collection area. It's kind of like the area of the solar panel, the size of the solar panel, or the diameter, um, the area swept by the windmill blades. This is the collection area. This is what's collecting our energy. And, uh, of course, the bigger the, the drainage area, the more energy you'll collect. And here's what, um, here's what the, when the information that the USGS collects and is put into a graph, this is what it looks like. And this is a little um, tricky to understand, so let me just walk you through this. What this is saying is that um, they've, they've uh, kept long-term records, um, the USGS, of the water level at Sparhawk Mills on the Royal River. And what this, over the, over the long term, what they're saying here is that 5% of the time, this, is, this value here is about maybe 1,000, let's say it's 1,000, 1,050. About 5% of the time, the flow is 1,000 cubic feet per second or more. And it, here it says that um, the, at, um, at around uh, oh, 400 cubic feet per second, 17% of the time it's 400 cubic feet per second or more. And then when you get down here, you know, when you get down here to say 50 cubic feet per second, well, 95% of the time it's almost never less than uh, 50 cubic feet per second. So we'll be able to use this curve to actually generate the total amount of energy, I mean, to calculate the total amount of energy we could generate over the period of a year at a, um, at a dam. And so that's, that's, this is going to be the key using the flow duration curve. And we'll look at, look at this in more detail. Now let's look at rivers and lakes in Iowa. <clears throat> so here's Iowa. And we're going to, we're going to zone in on the Skunk River. And the Skunk River has a drainage that goes uh, about 200 miles and it's about 20 miles wide. So it's about 4,000 square miles as opposed to the uh, Royal River, which is only 141 square miles. And there it is. That's the drainage area of the Skunk River. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, so. This is a gauging station on the Skunk River, and what this is, this is how the USGS uh, uh, keeps their information. And what they do is they measure the height of the water flowing in the river, and then they have a way to calibrate uh, based on the height of the water at their gauge how much cubic feet per second are flowing in the river. And so this is from 2015, just recently. Uh, going from December 2nd to December 9th and you can see that there must have been a rainfall event here around the 2nd and then there's less and less there's less and less water flowing in the river every day and again this gauge height <coughs> at for each um, um, uh, station on the river it can be converted easily into uh, cubic feet per second and the US Geological Survey does that for you so here's an here's some information on uh, the Skunk River and the Skunk River at um, the mouth of the river, which is uh, near a place called Augusta, uh, Iowa, the drainage area is about 4,400 square miles. And it says that uh, the volume in cubic feet per second is about 270. During low water in an ordinary dry year, the volume is about 270 cubic feet per second, which could power... At 10 feet of head, about 397, um, so 397 kilowatts. And low water average year, available 10 months of the year. So available 10 months of the year, you could, you'd, you'd have at least um, uh, 60 cubic feet per second. And horse, just to go between horsepower and kilowatts, it's about 75, uh, 0.75 uh, kilowatts per horsepower. And so <coughs> then if we look here, we can get uh, flow duration curve information. Now this is kind of hard to see, so I've taken this out. So if we look here, this is the uh, Skunk River at um, Mount Pleasant, Skunk River at Augusta, Skunk, Skunk River at Augusta. And um, this ha gives us the flow duration information for uh, 5, 50, 70, 95, and ni 90 and 95% flow exceedance. 
And so what this is saying, again, I, I, it's hard for you to read this, so I, I made it bigger here. It says that um, 5% of the time, the flow is 9,400 cubic feet per second or greater. 50% of the time, it's 880 f cubic feet per second or greater. All the way down to 95% of the time, it's 66 cubic feet per second. So almost all the time, there's at least 66 cubic feet per second. And once in a while, there's as much as 10,000, almost 10,000 cubic feet per second. So it's quite a range of flow. Uh, and then if I, we plot this, <coughs> this is what it looks like. So we got almost up to 10,000, and then this is what the curve looks like, <coughs> flow duration curve. And this is the percent of time is equaled or exceeded. So let's take a look at the Skunk River at Oakland Mills. Now the Skunk River at Oakland Mills is not, Oakland Mills is about 15 miles from here. It's between a Tumwin Mount, uh, it's between Fairfield and Mount Pleasant. And it's 4,001 square miles drainage area. And we don't have a gauging station there, but we do have one at Augusta, which is, um, uh, well, 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 we'll look at that later. <coughs> We'll look at that later. But the drainage area there, just to give you an idea, is 4,000 square miles. This is the variability of the flow. So this shows the annual pre precipitation at Mount Pleasant. So this goes from 1880 until 1970 or so. And you look here that there's some years we got as much as 50 inches of rain. A few years we got, a, a year we got as little as 20 inches of rain. And most of the time we're right around 30. 36 is the average. 34 is the average. Uh, normal average annual pre precipitation and um, so you can see the variability around the average here few years some years it's more and some years it's less and the, and the annual energy you're going to get is going to be directly related to this variation now it's not going to be so much related if you get a you know, huge amount of rainfall because you won't be able to manage all that rain your, your turbine will be too small to manage it but um, in general it's going to be, this is how, what your revenue is going to look like. It's going to vary like this. Now, let's talk about turbine types. <clears throat> uh, there, there are two ways to um, uh, classify turbine types. First is according to head. Do they work at high, medium, or low heads? An example of a high head turbine is the Pelton wheel. Uh, example of a medium head turbine is a propeller type or a Kaplan turbine. And low heads, you can also use propeller and Francis wheels. Now, another one is according to the method of operation. An impulse uh, turbine uses a jet of water, and um, on the, there's a high-pressure side of it where that jet of water, which might be, have a, a column of water 1,000 feet tall behind it, is impinging on those blades. And then on the low-pressure side, it's actually open to the air, so the water just spills out in the air on the other side. And this is a, a Pelton wheel is an example of, of that. Now, a reaction turbine operates differently. These are typically used in low head situations, and the turbine operates completely submerged in the water, and it uses a, what's called a draft tube, and we probably won't have time to get into the details of that, um, <clears throat> but let's take a look at um, when you're selecting a turbine. This is a kind of a graph that shows the discharge in cubic feet per second and the head in which uh, the turbine will operate. So. And you can always get um, more discharge by putting in more than one turbine. So you, you can see here that if you, if you have 10 feet of head, um, you, you have uh, the ability to use uh, a cross-flow turbine, a Kaplan turbine, and what's this other one? Uh, cross-flow and Kaplan are, seem to be the two main ones that you can use um, in, for that uh, range of, of head. And you could use this to select the type of turbine that you will use. Now, what are the, and then you, the, other, the other characteristic you want is, is what's the range of flow? In other words, can you adjust this turbine so that it doesn't operate just at one flow rate, one amount of water through the turbine, but you can vary it through the season so you can maybe adjust the blades so that they can take more or less water. And you can see that some of these turbines, like the full Kaplan, which is a propeller type turbine that has adjustable guide vanes that guide the water into the turbine and it also has adjustable blades that it can operate um, at very high efficiencies close to 90 percent from its full rated output which is one right here all the way down to oh even a third of its rated output it's still above 80 percent of uh, efficiency so this would be a great turbine to be able to follow the flow of a river as it varies um, <clears throat> so let's take a look. This is a this is a typical low head. Maybe this is the kind of thing you'd see at maybe Oakland Mills, at eight or ten feet of head, where you've got a, a dam on one side, <clears throat> the water flows into a a chamber, 
and flows through the turbine and out and and then goes through a draft tube and expands and then it, there's a lower water reservoir here where the water exits and this is what a, a propeller type turbine might look like and again these little guide vanes could be adjustable and the turbine blades could also be adjustable that's called a full kaplan where they're both adjustable this is a uh, <clears throat> this could be a francis type turbine again very similar where you've got um, you know a, a elevated water here you've got a lower water level here and the water <clears throat> there's a dam here and the water just flows through this is very much like the uh, power plant in uh, Atamwa looks exactly like this and here's what a Francis type turbine looks like and here's again the water is going to flow in through these guide vanes which are adjustable these are fixed they don't rotate and then they guide the water into the turbine here which does rotate okay and here's the cross flow we looked at that earlier um, again water flows in through here flows through the turbine and out and you can this guide vane uh, can be adjusted so that it can shut the water off completely to different sections of the turbine so that you can use it um, at part flow <clears throat> so high head turbines impulse type turbines that's typically a pelton wheel and we'll see these in colorado uh, and what happens here is the um, water it comes from a high elevation comes down and comes out a jet and hits a turbine that has um, blades that are designed to take the water from the jet and here's here's an example this one has two different jets on it you can have more than one jet and you can, that that way you can adjust for the flow if you have a lot of flow you can use both jets if you have lower flow you can just use one here's what the blades look like and here's a here's an example of something I think this comes from uh, one of the power plants we went to visit last time I went to uh, Colorado and uh, you can see that there'd be there'd be jets of water that would squirt um, maybe from water that's that's uh, got a pressure of thousand feet of of height onto these um, <clears throat> um, buckets these little veins so let's look at the design process <coughs> for a hydroelectric power plant first thing we need to do is determine the head how much the water is going to flow we've talked about that and then we have to determine the flow over time we have to look at um, <clears throat> we have to look at how the flow varies throughout the year and what percentage of the time the turbine might operate at different flow rates and for that we use a flow duration curve from US, Ge US geological survey data then we have to select the appropriate turbine <clears throat> and calculate the annual production so let's go through that for Oakland Mills in this case it's 4001 square miles of drainage located between Fairfield and Mount Pleasant about 15 miles from the classroom let's assume we're going to have eight feet of head there when we maybe we're going to repair this dam and make it a little taller and we'll get eight feet of head now the flow <coughs> it, there's a bit of an issue here because flow records are not readily available for the skunk river at Oakland Mills and so um, <coughs> the fl but flow records are available for the skunk river at Augusta which is just a little further downstream and so we can use a ratio of these drainage areas to account for the difference in uh, amount of water be at Oakland Mills and skunk river so let's look at the flow records so one place to start on the design is to use the mean or average flow and that turns out to be 2600 cubic feet per second <clears throat> let's take a look at the some of these flow records and we're going to stop here and I'll finish this uh, lecture later